Well, a second Vince McMahon question from Jack here, Vin, uh, Vince. A Vince second, oh, thank you. <laughs> excuse me, Jim. Thank you, pal. Jack's second question here. Would you please tell the story of when you rode with Vince and how much he scared the shit out of you? Oh, good God. Um, well, everybody knows that's been around Vince for any length of time. Yes, he, he likes to be in control, and he also believes that he is the best in the world at everything and is completely invulnerable and invincible. And uh, told the story about when we were misdirected on a flight because of weather. We were going back from somewhere, a, a, a television taping, back into the Northeast, and we were supposed to go to Newark, I believe it was, but the weather, all the Northeast airports, New York area is just fucked. And can't go to Newark, and can't go to LaGuardia, and can't go to what was the Kennedy back there, whatever the third airport is. What is it up there? It's Kennedy. I'm asking you. It's yeah, Kennedy. It's okay. Newark, LaGuardia, and Kennedy. All right. Well, we never used Kennedy anyway. But anyway, um, so they make this announcement on the plane, and of course Vince is sitting there in first class, and I'm, I'm a couple rows back. I think I might have upgraded with my frequent flyer or whatever, right? But Vince hits his button. Calls the stewardess over. I see the conversation. She walks off. A few minutes later, he's looking around like, you know, nothing's happening. He gets up, goes up, knocks on the cockpit door. And this was pre-9-11, but still, it's a, it, not exactly the fucking protocol that the passengers could just go knock on the fucking cockpit door and talk to the captain. Apparently, he had demanded that the from the stewardess that she get one of the pilots to come out and explain why that we couldn't go to fucking White Plains. It's just right, just right up the road because he wants to get back and work a half a day at the office. And now this is if we're rerouted to Albany, which was their plan, this is not going to happen because it's a it's 180 miles. And he's knocking on a door and people start coming and there's, and finally one of the pilots comes out and does indeed talk to him and talks him and says, look, we can't do anything else. This is what we got to do. I'm like, motherfucker, I don't care if we go to Des Moines, if it's good weather, it's not landing a fucking thunderstorm, right? I don't, I don't love to work that much. So then we, they take us to Albany. Oh, we're going to have to run a car to get back. Now he's pissed because he's missed the afternoon of work at the office. Because by the time we get in the car in Albany, it's fucking one o'clock. What right? So we're we're not gonna get back till four thirty ish, and it's pouring rain. <clears throat> well, he gets he's all drive, and I'm back in the back seat with Bruce. Jr's up in the front, and Vince is driving. I'm people exaggerate and say hundred miles an hour. He may have hit that in a couple of the straight stretches, but he's doing consistently eighty five or ninety in the fucking rain. I'm back there. My asshole has fucking clinched up six square yards of the fucking upholstery material, and I'm gripping the fucking seat. And everybody else is just trying to look at their shit to, you know, avoid having to fucking deal with the obvious fact that we're being piloted by a lunatic, right? And he's a great driver, but still, fuck. So that's, we got back in record time, like two and a half hours from Albany, New York to Stamford, Connecticut. And that is when I decided I'm going to do everything at all costs to avoid riding with Vince McMahon from now on. And then J Jim Ross was uh, later sometime, it may have been a year or two later, I think his phrase to Vince was, Vince, I, I love you and you're a friend of mine, but I love my children also and I want to see them again. So I'm not going to ride with you anymore. <clears throat> and, and, and Bruce would have let him strap him to the fucking fender like a deer and do whatever, <laughs> right? Yeah. But it just, because he had no fear of anything. He thought he was, if, if he's going to drive, he's the best driver in the world. He, the laws don't apply to him. There was that time that cop pulled him over and gave him the ticket for speeding. And it's like, I've told that story. I won't chew my food twice, but finally this poor rookie cop been on the fucking job two days. It looked like when he fucking finished it and Vince is fuming. Cause now we're sitting on the side of the road instead of going. So when he finishes writing the ticket, he hands it to Vince and his stock line they've taught him in trooper school is, if you don't have any more questions, sir, you're free to go. And Vince snatches that fucking ticket out of his hand, throws it on the goddamn dashboard, doesn't say a word with that disgusted Vince look on his face, pops it into drive, spins out on the shoulder, the fucking gravel flying everywhere, and back on the interstate doing 70 miles an hour, I turn around in time to see that fucking cop 
doing the hop and skip to avoid the gravel in his eyes and nuts and just standing there with his hands at his side staring at Vin. I'm like, motherfucker, why would you not get in the car and chase this guy down again? <laughs> if it had been me, he would have put me under the jail. But it's Vince. He just is. And he didn't even know who Vince McMahon was. It's just the power of that personality. The cop didn't want any more fucking Vince. Just let him do what he's going to do. Didn't Harley Race have a similar reputation for driving? Oh, God, I never rode with Harley, but yes, he did. Probably faster. And the one thing, Vince would never be drunk while he was driving. Har well, Harley might not be drunk, but he would be drinking. Um, yeah, 100 miles an hour everywhere in a boat or a fucking car or whatever. On in a snowstorm, yeah. on the side of the road, <laughs> making his own roads. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's – and and – you know, imagine this, Harley been in several near fatal car wrecks going all the way back to when he first got into business that killed his wife and daughter. And I'm not saying this was his fault. I don't know what it was when he was very young. Uh, but they said he, he'd never walk again and they were going to cut his fucking leg off. And Gus Karras, the promoter from Kansas City, came in and said, fuck you, you're not. And took him out of that hospital and took him to his own doctor and saved his wrestling career. Yeah, and of course he started by driving Happy Humphrey around. That must have been an adventure. Uh, God, and he would also have to, because Humphrey couldn't get in the fucking showers at the buildings half the time, so he'd have to do the wash off like the circus elephants with the garden hose for Happy Humphrey, who was eight hundred and what two pounds. William J. Cobb of Macon, Georgia. I just found an issue of Wrestling Confidential from '64 that covers Happy Humphrey's stay at a weight loss center in, I think, Atlanta. And he had dropped 400 pounds. He was 400 pounds. He still looked huge, but he was clearly half the size he had previously been. Well, and in when I first started getting the Guinness Book of World Records in the early 70s, because I used to get every year when it came out, I had to see who'd broken what, right? He was down in one of them, if I'm not mistaken, for not only being 802 pounds at the time in the 50s was the heaviest human ever recorded also, but but then for losing like almost 600 pounds at one point, which is why he disappeared from wrestling because what, why do you need a 200 pound happy Humphrey? 